Good morning. Thank you, Sally. Today's reading comes from chapter 1 of Luke, verses 26 to 49. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. You have found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Amen. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, David. Faith is God's gift to us, one of the many gifts. It's something we can ask for and something that God's spirit grows within us. And it's a little bit like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. And this morning we're looking at Mary and her remarkable faith. A few weeks ago, when we were in the Old Testament still, I gave a definition of faith, which I rather like. Can anyone remember what it was? Faith is... Faith is reason in a courageous mood. I rather like that. We start with what we know, with what we've experienced, with reason. But then we step out. Faith happens when we step out building on that knowledge. And that's the sort of faith that Mary had. And we're going to look at three encounters that she had to see that faith in action. The first two we read about. The third one we know about because it's a very familiar one. But um, I can't see on the screen what's going on. So I'm going to click in faith. That there it is. He says... Dead batteries, I think, Tim. Uh, it's not connected at the front. Okay. Um, I'll wave at you, Stuart, and if you can press the button. So that was a wave. 
Brilliant. This was a shocking announcement. Mary was going to be pregnant, and not only was Joseph not the father, there wasn't going to be a human father. And that shocking news was multiplied because Mary was a teenage girl. Historians agree that she was almost certainly somewhere between 12 and 14 years old. She was an illiterate peasant girl whose prospects in life were, in those days, limited to hoping to marry a good man. She would have known very little of life. In some ways, she was a, a nondescript person. And she lived in a nondescript place. Nazareth, a scruffy halfway stop between the ports of Tyre and Sidon. It would have been overrun by travellers, Roman soldiers and non-Jews. It's not mentioned at all in the Old Testament. Nothing important happened there. In fact, one of the people who was invited by Jesus to follow him later on when he'd grown up commented, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? In choosing Mary, God bypassed the big spectacular holy places. He ignored the important people and chose an apparent nobody who lived in a nothing town in the middle of nowhere to be the person who not only would bring Jesus into the world, but who would then bring him up to prepare him for his ministry. Just let that sink in for a minute. It wasn't just about giving birth to Jesus. She was going to be responsible for bringing him up in such a way that he was ready to fulfill his ministry. What a responsibility. But one of the good things about God choosing Mary is that we know he could choose anyone to do his will, including you and me. Mary was not expressing, expecting an angel. Have you noticed how in the New Testament particularly, angelic appearances tend to begin with, do not be afraid. It's not surprising, really. I mean, if you're not expecting an angel and then, ta-da, we'd be pretty terrified if a heavenly being turned up and started to talk with us. I do wonder whether Gabriel was in his full heavenly glory or whether he kind of turned it down a bit for Mary. Whatever, she uh, wasn't just shocked by his sudden appearance, but his message had shocking implications for her. The shock waves from this visit were life-changing for Mary and her reputation. An unmarried teenager who was now going to be pregnant. It would ruin everything. Her engagement to Joseph may well be cancelled. I mean, who would believe him for not believing, or who would blame him for not believing her story about angels and miraculous conceptions? her local reputation would have been trashed. If the engagement was broken off, that would have been disgrace for her. But then people would have started to notice her abdomen swelling. And they would start to put two and two together and make a number bigger than three. And they might have started to gossip behind her back, or even worse, directly to her face. And then Gabriel tells us the astonishing news about who this baby is. Look at how Jesus was described by Gabriel. Yes, he's called Jesus. Now, that was a very common name in those days. It's a Greek version of Joshua, but it's laden with meaning because it means God saves. And then Gabriel says he will be great, the son of the Most High. He will be a new sort of king from David's line. His kingdom will be much bigger and better than David's because it's going to last forever. In short, Jesus is coming to a, establish a whole new world order. And all of this starts with the angel saying to Mary she was going to have a baby. And she showed incredible faith. She did ask a fairly good question. How will this be since I'm a virgin? It's very fair for her to ask that, I think. And there's nothing wrong with us asking God for a bit more information if he's talking to us about doing something or if we sense that he might be saying that we go, need to do something new. 
A step of faith may be reason in a courageous mood, but there's no harm in asking for a little bit more reason before we get courageous. And Gabriel's response to Mary was theological rather than gynecological. Nothing is impossible with God. In other words, don't worry about the how, Mary. God's spirit will make it happen. And then, as if to kind of underline it and boost Mary's faith, Gabriel tells her about Elizabeth being pregnant, six months pregnant by then. Further proof that God could do the impossible. That's a very definition of a miracle, isn't it? God can do the impossible. We may not get a full answer if we say to God, how will this be? I could do with a bit more information, please. But he will give us all that we need in order that we can take that step of faith. So with her question answered, and maybe the reassurance of knowing about Elizabeth, Mary agrees with just sublime grace. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Wow, what faith. She knew that God could do this, and she accepted her part in it. And it seems that the consequences <clears throat> publicly were less important to her than obeying God. When we're faced with God's plans, we may want to question what he's up to. We may not understand. To be honest, we're unlikely to get a full-blown angelic visitation to explain it all. But Mary's example is still helpful to us. Faith encourages us to look for God's present presence and his involvement, even in the midst of difficult and confusing circumstances. Faith builds on our knowledge of God's power, his ability, that he is the God of the impossible, and enables us to submit our lives to God's will. May we all receive and nurture that gift of faith. I'm going to move to scene two, which is Mary meeting Elizabeth. We don't know the exact relationship between Mary and Elizabeth. Perhaps they were cousins. But as we've seen over our last two weeks here, she was having a special baby that we would know as John the Baptist. And Mary spent a couple of months with her, apparently. Why did she go and see Elizabeth? Well, First of all, probably just to be sure that what the angel had said was true. Perhaps she went to get away from all the gossips in the town. Nothing's more corrosive than gossip. It never blesses anyone, even the gossips. So when she got there, Elizabeth recognised Mary's special circumstances. Her baby in her womb did some prenatal gymnastics somersaults in her womb at the presence of Mary, who by this time had Jesus inside of her. And Elizabeth, we're told, was filled with God's spirit. And she had special insight for Mary. Blessed are you among women. I have a feeling Mary needed to hear that. Bearing in mind what she'd left behind in Nazareth, it certainly blessed her because she responded with this amazing statement of praise. Magnificat, it's not a feline superhero. It means magnify, make bigger. Mary responded with praise. And did you notice the tense that Mary used to praise God? She praises God in the past tense. But she's talking about things happening now and in the future. It's called the prophetic past or the prophetic present. And what happens is that we can be so certain that God is going to do something that we can speak about it as if it's already happened. That's the way that Mary was speaking. 
For her, God has become bigger. Her understanding, her faith, her experience of God, her faith in him were growing because of all that was happening, just like the baby inside her. And that's true for us too. Just as things get bigger in our vision, as they get closer to us, as we get closer to God, so he becomes larger in our experience, in our spiritual vision. Mary rejoiced in God. She recognised that God had done great things for her, for all who fear him, and she praised him. Now, fearing God isn't about being afraid and frightened. It's a realisation of who God is that almost makes you tremble. It sends a shiver down your spine. That's what the fear of God is. And Mary had this astonishing understanding that made her tremble. Just think for a moment about yourself and your relationship with God. This is God Almighty. And he wants to call you his child. If that doesn't send a shiver down your spine, what will? Mary rejoiced in God. And then she rejoiced because God was restoring things to be the way he wants them to be. She reflected on the new world order that the angel had said her son would bring in. And praised God for this, this new equality as she sees it. The way that God wants the world to be, not the way that it actually is. The way things have always been intended to be in God's plan are going to be put in place because of her son. No wonder she praised God. Sometimes I think we need other people to help us to get God's perspective on things. There was something about Elizabeth's insightful greeting that reassured Mary and released this amazing Magnificat, this song of praise. I wonder, do you need an Elizabeth right now to encourage you in your faith? It means you need to be willing to receive that sort of encouragement from somebody else, to be open to what God might be saying in them for you. Or maybe God wants you to be an Elizabeth for somebody else, to come alongside them and speak words of hope and encouragement to them. You might not know what the words are, but if God's prompting you, he'll give you them. And just as an aside, how encouraged do you think Elizabeth would have been that Mary visited and all of this happened? Because for her, it would have confirmed not just that she was going to have a baby, but that her baby was going to do all the things. He was going to prepare the way for Jesus. The more experience we have of God, the bigger he becomes in our life. The more we reflect on what he's done for us and respond in praise, the stronger our faith will grow. And praise isn't just about singing on a Sunday through your face mask. It's an opportunity to use all of your God-given creativity to express yourself in all sorts of ways. You can offer your daily work as an act of worship. Or how about this? Think about all of the things that God has promised you, God is offering you, and write a prayer about them in the past tense, as if they've already happened. It may seem a bit strange, but it's a way of grounding the truth of what God is saying to you. So, so far we've had two different encounters, Mary meeting with Gabriel and then meeting with Elizabeth. We're now gonna move into chapter two. You'll have to do some homework if you want to read that for yourself later on, because this is where Mary is meeting with the shepherds. 
I decided that rather than reading that as well, because we would have been here a long time, we probably know about that encounter fairly familiar. Mary, by now, is in Bethlehem. She'd gone there with Joseph in order to fulfill the requirements of the Roman census. And while she was there, she had the baby. She was well outside her comfort zone. First of all, she was in Bethlehem, away from the support and love of her mother and wider family, if they were still around, and even far away from the wonderful Elizabeth. Secondly, she was giving birth in a stable. Now, don't think of warm, cosy nativity stables. This was a communal space. It was open to the elements. It was not in any way private. It was like a car park for the travellers at the inn, but instead of cars, there were animals. And then this limited privacy, however much she had, was invaded by this group of shepherds. Rough sleepers who were considered outcasts because they were unable to take part in all of the regular religious rituals. And they told Mary how they'd seen angels and had been informed of Jesus' birth by this heavenly host. Now, if it had been me, I think I'd have been a little bit miffed by this point. I think I might have complained. I mean, surely... It shouldn't have been like this. Where in the small print that Gabriel must have given her did it say anything about giving birth in circumstances like that and then having these strangers turn up? But no. Mary treasured these things in her heart. Not just the shepherd's visit and the angels on the hillside, but all that had happened to her. She didn't just remember them. Luke says she treasured treasured them. She cherished them. Why? Well, even in these extraordinary circumstances, she knew that God was at work. Despite the difficulties, she knew God was in control and that that was the most important thing. Did it seem like God had things under control? when they had to respond to the census and travel to Bethlehem on Mary's due date? Did it seem like God had things under control when there was nowhere for them to stay other than a multi-story donkey park? It didn't seem like it. But when we stop and think for a moment, it is a little bit typical of God. He doesn't conform to our expectations. He doesn't even think outside the box because for God there is no box. But eventually, if we trust him, if we have faith, it makes sense. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, wonderful counsellor, mighty God, the one for whom the hallelujah chorus is woefully inadequate, was born in the most humble of circumstances to show how completely he had stripped himself of all of his heavenly glory. The Bethlehem bit, well, that was to fulfill ancient prophecy so that people later on would say, oh, yeah, we can see how God's joined up all the dots. The shepherds visiting, I think that was to show that Jesus had come into the world for everyone, but perhaps particularly for those on the margins, that they were to be welcomed in to the centre of God's family. In your current circumstances, You may be asking yourself, what is God doing? Or maybe you've asked it in the past, or you're thinking about somebody else and wondering, what is going on? You may be feeling well outside your comfort zone. Maybe physical or emotional pain is marring your life experience. Or maybe you just feel that people have got the wrong end of things They don't understand. God is still with you. He's there right in the midst of it. In the midst of the confusion and in the way that things don't fit together, he is there. And if you look for him, you will find him in the most unlikely places and people. 
There are obvious places where we find him in words of encouragement from other people, in the pages of the Bible, even in a warm hug. But you can actually find him in the tears of forgiveness or pain. In silent reflection or, or even in the words or kindness of a stranger. Mary would need these treasured memories to help her maintain her faith later in life when she saw her son rejected and hung on the cross to die. And we draw strength from those words today, don't we? So I want to encourage you to do some treasuring. Treasure those moments when you are aware of God's presence, of his hand at work in your life, of something he has said to you. Build up a library of them. You may be someone who likes to write a journal. Write them down. You may have a, a box of treasures and you could put things into it that remind you of those moments when you were blessed by God through others as well as directly. Treasure them, cherish them, because later on, you may draw strength from them. You may be able to see the value of them, these treasures, and use them to bless yourself or others as they go through tough times. Mary was an extraordinary young woman, and yet she was really ordinary. Her faith may have been amazing, but actually it's no greater faith than you or I can have. It starts when we ask for faith and God's spirit gives that gift to us. And then simple trust in God grows from there. I wonder if there's a, a seemingly impossible thing that you need somebody else to encourage you with. Ask God to send that person to you. And if you sense God prompting you, then respond to that. Go and encourage someone else. Our faith will grow as we trust God with small things and discover he doesn't let us down. The more we trust him, the more trustworthy we discover he is. Faith isn't just belief, it's reason in a courageous mood, it's action. What's God asking you to do?